Princess Bride. <laughs> That's my favorite love story. <laughs> you don't know what that is? No. Yeah, you guys. Oh my gosh. You gotta unpack that. Princess <laughs> guy. She says, "Farm boy, fetch me that picture," and he says, "As you wish." Don't you don't know. No. You guys are so young. I don't know if it's so much of a love story. Do, we, do you guys remember a different world? That show, the relationship between Whitley and Dwayne Wade. They were like two totally, totally, totally different people. Whitley was like this prima donna, you know, this like um, Hollywood type chick, and her boyfriend was just like a really geek, you know, kind of corny. Nobody wanted him, you know, that kind of thing. Not, not as popular as she was, but yet they made like this love connection. Like they both respected who they were, and they still fell in love. Like I enjoyed that. I got this. It's a good movie. Fifty first dates. Right? Because, wait, why is it so quiet? <laughs> That's an amazing movie. Because, let me tell you why. It's got Drew Barrymore in it. And basically, Drew Barrymore can't remember past this day where she got into a car crash. And Adam Sandler falls in love with her. And basically, he tries to make her fall in love with him every day. You know, a lot of guys, a lot of girls, it's like when you get that significant other, you think that's it. You think, oh, I'm good. You know, I got this person that loves me and we live happily ever after. No. The truth of it is like 51st dates is how it should be, where you make that other person fall in love with you every single day. So boom. <laughs> 51st dates. everyone. So I'm actually really sick. Um, is anyone else feeling a little sick today? A little tired? Got some stuff going on? Um, for me to get through this, I'm going to need to pray. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me. If you are sick in any way, if you have any kind of pain or anything, I'm just going to invite you to open up your hands and receive this prayer with me. So Lord God, we thank you so much that you are a God you're a God that heals. And Lord, right now we just offer this time to you. We pray that your presence would overflow in this room so greatly that sickness and pain and anything that would distract us from your love would just flee from your presence, God. Lord, would you come in your gentle love? I pray that my sickness would not be a distraction, but it would point to in our weakness, you are strong. In the moments that they cannot hear my voice, God, I pray that they would hear your heartbeats. So Lord, come and, and say everything that you want to say today about love and loving on us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> um, so I'm sick. But nothing could keep me from coming up here today to talk about what I'm going to talk about. And that's this whole concept of rethinking romance, of love, of love story. And because we're talking about romance today, I thought it would be um, appropriate and fun if I told you the story of me and my husband. So, thanks. So, <laughs> so last month was my husband's birthday. And in honor of his birthday, I made him a love book. And it's kind of a book, it's kind of a journey of um, since the day we met to where we are now. So I thought it would be kind of cool if I read it to you guys. You ready? All right, I'll take that as a yes. All right. Once there was a girl named Jen who had many dreams, but one night she started having different dreams. She dreamed about a boy named Jay who was a teacher but kept saying, I have to go back south. One day, thanks to a good friend, Jen met Jay in real life and told him about the dreams. I've been dreaming about you. I'm going to marry her. It wasn't long before Jay wanted to start hanging out. Jay, hey, let me show you around town and show you big houses. <laughs> there were immediate fireworks. At first, the idea of a relationship scared Jen, especially when Jay first told her he liked her. Why is she crouching like that? Can I just drive her home now? This sucks. I can't breathe. But deep inside, Jen was ready for a man like Jay. They had some fun adventures. 
and then they knew they were ready. So in the eye of a hurricane, they said their wedding vows and celebrated in the greatest place on earth, Hawaii. There were some rough times. I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. But also some really good times. Because he encouraged her. You don't have to be afraid. I love you. They both loved games. They knew how to play together. They supported each other's ministries. Jesus loves you beyond your sin. He doesn't just love you, he likes you. <laughs> and so to this day, Jay holds Jen's hands and her heart. The end. Um, I was all about the fairy tales. Like growing up, I had all those like Disney movies and those big giant plastic VHS tapes. And then after I graduated from Disney, I moved on to like Saved by the Bell. And after Saved by the Bell was Friends. And after Friends was Sex in the City. And anything that Hollywood and the media could, could feed me about romance and love. And so much that I love fairy tales that even when my husband proposed to me, he made me a tracing coloring book of The Little Mermaid because it's my favorite. At the end of the book, he said, let's create our own fairy tale. Aww. <laughs> right? But what you don't see in this book, what you don't see in all these fairy tales is the really difficult times, is the really hard times. Um, I'm just going to be very candid because I feel like people don't talk about this, especially Christian people, but there was a time once when I just thought in our marriage, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. And I started packing up my things and I packed up my dogs. And before I left, Jay came home and he stopped me. And it wasn't this chasing me in the rain. It wasn't flowers and candy. It was a conversation about being committed to me and me to him. What has gotten us through those really difficult, those really painful times is not the memories of the fairy tales and, and the candy and, and the chasing in the rain, but the thing that's carried us through it is actually one of my most unromantic memories with this man, which is, Jay told me he loved me on our second date. So I know you guys are thinking like, wow, well, obviously it worked. That's in my mind. I'm sitting there in his car thinking, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? And not only that, but he gives me a little sermonette about Isaiah chapter 54. And he references this verse that says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. So I'm thinking, what have I gotten myself into? Like, what is going on? And he explains to me that this passage about, is about the voice of God speaking to his people. And in it, he's saying, in faith, trust me, and, and increase your life to increase your space for what I'm going to give you, what I'm going to bring. And in it, he was saying to me, in faith, I'm going to increase my life to include you in it. And I am going to be so devoted and committed in pursuing you. Now, I still thought it was a little bit crazy, but it helped me understand that what he was essentially saying is that he was going to pursue me, and he was going to commit to that. And he said it wasn't an emotion thing, which made me kind of sad. Like, I expected that when someone told me they loved me, it would be like, oh, you know, the pools in your eyes are like the sun and the whatever, whatever. The things that I've heard growing up, but it was, it's not out of emotion, but it's out of the way that the Lord is committed to his people, I'm committed to you. <laughs> and so it's brought me on this journey to understand pursuit. And I think one of the most powerful illustrations, images of pursuit that we have in scripture is actually from the book of Song of Solomon, chapter eight. Now Song of Solomon is my favorite book in the Bible. It, it tells of this beautiful love story between a man and a woman, but um, I think a lot of people think that the relationship between God and us points to marriage, which isn't true. Marriage and a relationship between a man and a woman points to the relationship of God and his people. And so I wanted to read chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, which says, Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, 
its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. I believe that these verses is actually an Old Testament prophecy of Jesus Christ to come. Of someone who would come whose love was so powerful that it would go to death. Someone whose jealousy for his people would be so unyielding, so relentless that it would go to the grave and beyond. And so there's this image of, of grave and there's this image of the love of God going head to head, unyielding, not giving up. And ultimately the love of Jesus Christ wins. And it's so powerful that it's like a flame that cannot be controlled by water. And you have to think like how big would this flame be if water cannot quench it? So it's this image of, of this, this intense pursuit, this intense love that I think gives us better understanding to one of the most unromantic stories most of us have heard, which is the story of a man whom the Lord says, I want you to marry a prostitute. Now the book of Hosea is a, is a story of a prophet, and the Lord tells this prophet, I want you to marry Gomer, this woman. And I'm telling you now, she's going to be unfaithful, and she's not going to want you. And you're going to have children with her, and you're gonna wake up one day and wonder if which one, if any of them are even yours. And not only that, but she's not going to want you. In fact, she's going to go to all these other men to find more satisfaction. And ultimately, not only will she do that, but she'll start selling herself to these men. And after they don't want her anymore, after her value has been completely run dry, I want you to go and pay back for that which is already yours. And that will give you a glimpse of how I feel about my people. Now the beauty of Hosea is it's, it's a glimpse of God and his people. And I feel like oftentimes when we read it, we kind of just read chapters one and three, which is the narrative of Hosea and Gomer. But there's so much in here, there's so much between what God is saying to us that I want to reflect on that today, particularly chapter two. So if you do have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading from Hosea chapter two today. <coughs> Excuse me. Say of your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved one. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert, turn her into a parched land, and slay her with thirst. I will not show my love to her children, because they are the children of adultery. Their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my, lo my lovers, who gave me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, my olive oil and my drink. Therefore, I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. She will chase after her lovers, but not catch them. She will look for them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my husband as at first, for then I was better off than now. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold, which they used for bail. Therefore, I will take away my grain when it ripens and my new wine when it is ready. I will take back my wool and my linen intended to cover her naked body. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will take her out of my hands. I will stop all her celebrations, her yearly festivals, her new moons, her Sabbath days, all her appointed festivals. I will ruin her vines and her fig trees, when she said, which she said were her pay from her lovers. I will make them a thicket, and wild animals will devour them. I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the bales. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot, declares the Lord. Now, in a quick reading of this, it just sounds really intense and really scary, and really angry, and kind of not cool. But as I read it again, I realize that we're actually invited to read the journal of a husband that's been betrayed. 
of a man who, whose wife has left him and pretty much said, I don't want you. I want anyone else but you. And we get a glimpse into the raw emotions of a lover that's been scorned. And when we look at this passage, at this time, Israel was actually doing pretty okay. Like they were pretty affluent at this time. They weren't struggling as much. They were actually um, involved in a lot of trades with these other nations. And because of these trades with these other nations, they were acknowledging these other gods. And because they were acknowledging these other gods, they were worshiping these other gods. And in that, they were worshiping these other gods and, and the grain and the wine and the oil that was coming from their land, they were attributing it to these other gods. And so here's this God who's pretty much everything that comes from the earth comes from him. And he's watching his people give credit to others, you know, loving on others, worshiping on, on others. And this image of him punishing Israel, it sounds really intense, and it sounds really angry, but what he's ultimately saying is, I'm going to cut you off from these other lovers. Why? Because when you don't have anything else to give them, they're not going to be there for you. They are not going to protect you. They're not going to provide for you. They're not going to love on you the way that I do. I'm going to cut you off now before you're hurt even more. I know many times in my own, my own life, I felt like God was just taking away good things from my life to be angry and to punish me, quote unquote. When in reality, it's his gentle pruning of the things that are slowly destroying and eating away at us. And if the Lord really wanted to punish Israel, then what he should have done is to stone all of them. Because Mosaic law stated, having adultery required stoning, and that's not what God wanted to do. Throughout Hosea, there is this constant back and forth between the Lord saying, I'm so fed up, I'm so frustrated, you guys have done this to me again and again and again, I'm so heartbroken, I can't do this anymore, to, but I have to have you, and I will do whatever it takes to keep you and to win you back. And so the shift comes in verse 14. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There, I will give her back her vineyards, and she will make the valley of Accor a door of hope. There, she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the Baals from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth, and the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. And I love this. And I love this, and, and I think it's, it's heartbreaking that we just read about Hosea and Gomer because these words are the words of someone aching with love. And this image of the Valley of Accor turning into a door of hope, the Valley of Accor was actually a place where they stoned this man named Achan because of his sins. And so this place rep represented for Israel their past sins, what it looks like when you've done something wrong, what it looks like when you've disobeyed God. And so this place that reminded them of their past shame, of their past wrongdoings, is now going to be a place of redemption, a place of hope. And I love this image of betrothing, because betrothing is speaking of engagement. And you don't really say that to someone you're already married to, but, but here it speaks of a new relationship of newness, new grain, new oil, new wine, new. It's not just patching up that which already happened, but it's a second chance. But the one that I love really in this, <coughs> you, will not, you will not call me 
my master, but you will call me my husband. Because when a master punishes and then pursues a servant that left him, it's not out of love. It's for him. It's for his pride. It's for his possessions. It's for his value. He pursues to say, look what I have. Look at the number of servants that are mine. This is about me. I'm going to bring you back to me because this will make me look good. But a husband that punishes, quote unquote, and pursues his wife, that's one of a deep aching, of a longing, of a desire, of a wanting, of a pursuing, of a deep, deep love. The one that says, you've done this, but nothing can keep me separated from you. When we get this, it changes everything. It changes the way we view God, that he's not this distant, angry king on a throne, but he is someone who's so intimately a part of our lives. When we get this, it changes the way that we view other people. Men, it changes the way that you'll view women and how you will pursue them. And women, it will change the way that you will allow yourselves to be pursued or not pursued. Why? Because it will change the way you view yourself, that you are someone that the Lord intimately loves. Years ago, years and years ago, when I first started doing ministry, I remember that I had in my mind, I had to get married. You know, as I was doing ministry, I was a single woman in ministry, and, and I had a number of pastors tell me, you need to get married. If you want to be serious in the church, you need to get married, you need to get married soon, you need to have kids, and then you'll be taken seriously. And so I had this concept, like, I need to get married, and, and then this thought of, well, I don't need true love because I have Jesus. And, you know, Christ died for me, so I can give him my happiness. I could give him my happily ever after. And I remember talking to my dad one day, and, and I was saying this to him, like, you know, it doesn't really matter who I marry because I have this relationship with Jesus and, you know, everything's fine and I don't need to be happy. I don't need joy. And my dad looks at me and he says, as your father, do you think I'm going to sit back and watch you marry someone that's going to make you unhappy? And in this moment, it was like, it was like heaven split open, and I felt like I heard the Lord say, what kind of God do you think I am that I would want this for you? <coughs> when we get this, we understand that we are already part of the most romantic story ever. Yes, Fifty First Dates is one of my favorite movies, too. You know, Princess Bride, I did see it. But this, the story of God and his people, that is the greatest romance story ever told through all of time. And there's this quote by C.S. Lewis that says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. The problem is not that these movies and, and, Roma, and, and Hollywood and Disney has made our view of romance and love too big. It's that it's made it too small. And that the love story that the Lord has for us is so much bigger, so much greater than anything we can ever imagine on this earth. What would it look like if you stopped pursuing God with your doings? Because we have become human doings where we're constantly busy and we're constantly doing or constantly trying to earn the love of God rather than just sitting and being with him. There's something very powerful, there's something very intimate when you can sit in silence with someone you love, not saying or doing anything. Because you know them, you intimately know them, and you're just enjoying that moment with them. You know, last week, Pastor Peter talked about silence and solitude. Why? Because that's what cultivates this intimacy, this being pursued by this God that, that loves us so powerfully. When I started to get this, 
I started to pray this prayer that at the very beginning was very scary for me, which was, God, enjoy me. And the reason why that prayer was so scary was because I wasn't doing anything while I was praying it. I was just sitting there. And the idea that he could enjoy me while I'm sitting and doing nothing but just being myself, I could not believe that to be true. But as I started praying it, and I started just sitting silently with the one that my heart loves, things began to change. The greatest romance story ever told. There's this worship song that I love, um, How He Loves by John Mark McMillan. Now many of you may know this song, and many of you may even know the David Crowder's version of the song. Now on his blog he wrote about, um, several years ago David Crowder went up to him and said, can I change one line in your song? Not because I don't like it, and he asked for permission, but because I know that so many people, they cannot understand it, and they cannot appreciate it. And so the line, heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss, was changed into heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss. Because our view of deep romance, of deep love, of deep intimacy has been so skewed that when you hear lines like that, we immediately think it's lust. But the view of heaven and earth colliding and entangling in such a beautiful, majestic way, that's the story of God's love story for us. I want to end with a fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a princess. Now, on the day that she was born, she was stolen from her crib by enemies of the king. And these enemies, they forced her to live in this shack. They forced her to live in this dark, secluded place with this family who every day told her, you're ugly, you're unwanted, you're worthless, we don't want you. And so every single day she heard these words and, and every single day she believed this. And in order for her to survive and to eat by this family that did not want her, she learned how to steal. She learned how to steal food from the table. And one day as she grew up, she, she's in the forest, you know, as a lot of fairy tales are played, she's in the forest, and this prince approaches her. And instantly this prince falls in love with her. And he says to her, I want to take you with me to a kingdom so much better than this. I can promise you so much better things than what you have right now. And her immediate response, you don't know me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am. If you get to know me, you're just going to leave me, so why should I even bother? But he kept saying to her, I love you. I have better plans for you. So eventually, she packs up her stuff and she leaves, not because she loves him back, but because she's so scared of her current conditions. And as they're traveling and, and as they're journeying on towards this kingdom that's very, very, very far away, they stop by this town, and she does the only thing she knows how to survive, which is to steal food from the table. But unfortunately, on that day, she was caught. And this was a town that did not tolerate stealing. And so in a panic, she immediately says, it's the prince's fault. If he, if he really loved me, he wouldn't have let this happen. If he really loved me, he would have fed me. It's not my fault that this happened, it's his. And so the guards, they ask the prince, is this true? Is it your fault? And he looks at them, and he looks at her, and he says, yes, I'll take the punishment. And so they take him off to be executed. And it was then and only then that she got it, that the person who loved her more than anyone else on this whole planet was now gone. Days later, someone comes knocking on her door and it's the prince. She's like, what are you doing here? How did this happen? And he said, they tried to stone me. They tried to hang me. They tried to kill me. But my heart was too strong. I'm going to go back to my kingdom. The journey is really long and hard, but I'm going to come back for you. And his final words to her was, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Is it happily ever after? Not yet, but it's coming. Please pray with me.